mean, I would try to use guilt. Look at all the things I gave up for you. I would, I would do everything I thought was worth, even stuff that was stupid. I would do everything I could to try to pull her back because it's like, look at everything I've given up because I was still in phase two intently. That was in crystallization. And she was in deterioration. And interestingly, the more I tried to pull her back, the faster it sent her out toward the bottom of phase three. And when a person gets down there, and of course, at this point, she's seeing my flaws that she did not see before. Oh, and that's often when somebody will say something like this. I, I don't know who you are. You're not the same man. You're not the same woman that I fell in love with. <laughs> and your response would be, yes, I am. Look at me. But in actuality, they're correct. Because if you change your belief and value system, to make what you were doing okay so that you could do away with cognitive dissonance so you wouldn't feel as guilty, you did become another person. Because your belief and value system is part of who and what you are. It's part of your identity. And so when that person says, I don't know who you are anymore, you're not the person I fell in love with, even though you typically will not be able to see it, they're right. You have become a different person because you changed your beliefs and values. Now for me, I had changed my beliefs and values dramatically to allow me to do what I did. And so I, for a little while, became what I call an emotional atheist. I had a Bible degree, believe it or not. My bachelor's degree is in Bible. Some of my grad work, graduate work is in Bible. And I knew too much about the Bible to be able to say, oh, God wants me to be with this other woman. (laughs) I've heard people say that, but, you know, I was educated in the Bible and I couldn't. So what did I do? I didn't come to this logically. I came to this emotionally, although at the time I was convinced it was pure logic, which is God cannot exist. There is no God. And so I became what I call an emotional atheist. And the reason for that is because I didn't want God there because he was in my way. Remember when I said earlier that whoever comes between you and the LO becomes the enemy? Yeah, he was the enemy. My wife, Alice, was the enemy, even though I divorced her. Many of my friends became the enemy because they were saying, you're doing bad stuff, man. You're, what you're doing is wrong. So they became my enemies as well. And when finally she abandoned me, oh, let me, let me get out of my story for a minute and come back to the lower part of phase three, the deterioration. When it gets down toward the end, at least for one. And the other, by the way, might still be in phase two, or they both may be in phase three. Actually, if they're both in phase three and going at about the same pace, it's a lot better as to what's going to happen next. If one's still up there in phase two and the other one's in phase three, the one in phase two will do everything they can to change what's happening and try to get the person back. If that person finally gets down lower into phase three, the deterioration, where now I can see your flaws, where now I'm I'm not living with these rose-colored glasses about life. I now also see all the things that I lost because of you. Maybe I lost my children. I, I lost my marriage. I lost my beliefs and values. I lost my occupation. I lost my money. Whatever. I lost my best friends. I mean, those things that didn't matter at all when you were in phase two, because in crystallization, all that mattered was this other person's concern for you. At the end of phase three, it's like, oh my goodness, look what you cost me. Which in my situation is exactly what she went through. Which is why the vast, vast majority of people who have gone into limerence to the point where one or both left the other spouse so they could be together, never wind up together. The vast, vast majority of them never marry each other. I don't know the exact statistics on that. I actually saw one the other day. I just don't know how valid it was. It said that 95% of those couples don't marry each other. Now, that seems to be true based on what I've seen. I just can't validate that statistic. And for those that do marry in a situation like that, the divorce rate's over 80%. Now, if you say, well, if the national divorce rate is 50%, <laughs> we're talking about a lot bigger deal here that, you know, less than 20% of them stay married. Some do. Now, for those who are saying, so is limerence love? The answer is yes. It's a kind of love, but it's a relatively short-lived love. 
I mean, in terms of looking at a lifetime, even if it were to last 48 months, it's just not that long. So it's a relatively short lived love. Plus, if you think about it, it's a love that even though it's focused on making the other person happy, is motivated by my emotion, the intense emotion I feel of fear that we won't want to be together, and that nobody's ever understood me like you. I don't know if I could exist without you. You're my soulmate. And so it's driven by those kind of emotions, which means that even though it focuses on making the other person happy, the motivations behind it are all about me. Not really about you. It's not what about what's best for you. Because if if I am married to Alice and I'm involved with Sally Sue, if my if my motivation really was I need to do what's best for people, not just Alice, but what's best for Sally Sue, I wouldn't continue in a limit relationship with her. So while it's a kind of love, it's really a kind of love that's at base very selfish, even though it's focused on making the LO happy. So you say, well, then of those 5%, if that number's right, that do get married, and now they're one of those less than 20% that actually stay married, can they develop a good marriage? Yes. Uh, again, if your spouse is limerous, I know you don't want to hear that. But yes. At the same time, though, I think this is without exception. If there's been an exception, I don't remember it. The people who have done that have told me, okay, we're going to make this marriage work, but if we had a time machine, we'd go back and this would have never happened. Wait a minute, I just remembered one exception. It was a woman who had been so terribly treated by her husband that she was with when she fell into limerence with this other gentleman. I mean, this guy was a, a monster. She didn't say that. She didn't say, I'd go back and do it again. I'd go back and live with a monster. But you can understand that, right? I'm just saying the odds of them being together are very, very small. Now, if that takes away your hope, I'm sorry, but I'd rather tell you what's true so that your hope is based on something that's truly possible than to give you false hope, which is just not going to occur. Now, let me go back to something I was saying earlier then. When a person comes out of that, when he or she finally goes through phase three, they don't always come home. Why? Well, if you've ever listened to our podcast before, you've heard me say something such as, people don't leave what they have unless they believe what they're going to is better. People don't leave what they have unless what they're going to, at least in their belief system, is better. And so if I leave Alice because I want to be with Sally Sue, in my perception, being with Sally Sue is better. Even if it's not in reality, if that's my perception, which limerence, of course, would create, then I want to be with her because it's better. So then when Sally Sue, by the way, that's not her real name, obviously. Well, maybe not, obviously. I'm sure there's some Sally Sue's out there, but her real name is not Sally Sue. When Sally Sue goes through phase three deterioration, I'm still in phase two crystallization, and I'm trying to pull her back. And she didn't come back. At some point, I had to accept the fact that she wasn't coming back. And whenever I finally did accept that, my limerence began to go away. It did not go away nearly as fast as hers did because she was in control. What I mean by that is that when she went into phase three, it was like, this is my own decision. I want out of this. I was still in phase two. It was like, this is not my decision. As a matter of fact, this is uncontrollable. I need her to be here with me, and she's not going to be. And so I felt out of control, which meant that my phase three took longer. And we're still that loop up and down, looped up and down, et cetera, et cetera. When she got toward the end of phase three, it was pretty fast. And at that point, it was a straight line when she got toward the end. Did I call my wife, Alice, who that, that I had divorced, and say, will you take me back? The answer is no. In my mind, I had so vilified Alice that I saw being alone as being better than being with her, even though that vilification wasn't accurate. In my mind, it was. Oh, and by the way, when everything fell apart for me, I started drinking and drinking pretty heavily and then started hanging out in places I didn't used to hang out. You know, going places I'd never gone before, doing things I'd never done before. And all of a sudden, I'm living this hedonistic lifestyle that's just uh, revelry. I mean, all kinds of things. 
And then I evolved to the point where thinking, maybe devolved is the better word of thinking, and that's better than being married. I want to live like this. This is amazing. I mean, look how much fun I'm having. And I couldn't live like this if I went back to Dallas, or actually if I married anybody. <laughs> and that lasted for a while. Until finally, finally I got a little bit more maturity and began to realize my life's pretty miserable. I miss my children. Even though I did see them every other weekend, I miss my children. I want to be with them more. And I'm not going to go into the rest of my story except to say that I called Alice and said, would you consider taking me back? She wasn't sure if she wanted to or not. <laughs> she was already dating somebody else. Apparently a good guy. I never met him. Apparently a good guy. And so what happened with her is that she had to think about it. And so she asked all of her religious friends, who all said, no, 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 don't take him back. She asked all of her family, who said, double no, don't you dare take him back. She asked her friends, who said, no, don't take him back. And after two weeks of contemplation, decided she would. Oh, you can ask her why someday if you ever meet her. But basically what she said was, I realized every relationship was a risk. Even the guy I was dating now, every relationship was a risk and... I believe that at heart, Joe was a good man who had done some really bad things, and I decided it was worth the risk to try it again. No, we were not madly in love at that point. As a matter of fact, we didn't go back into limerence with each other. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. That didn't happen. And it wasn't even strong romantic love to begin with. It was a decision to do the right thing, which is also, by the way, a kind of love. To do the right thing for each other, to do the right thing for our children, the right thing for our families, so forth and so on. And I can assure you that now, and it didn't take, you know, decades. <laughs> it didn't happen in weeks or months, but it didn't take long years either. Uh, we, we actually developed a very deep and true love for each other again and have it to this day and will until the day we die. Now, if you've understood this, I realize I've probably caused a lot more questions <laughs> by giving some of the answers. And if you're the kind of person who was listening saying, I am so frustrated because you explained the three phases, but you didn't give me the demarcation. Like this is when they moved to phase two, exactly. And this is exactly when they moved to phase three. And this is exactly where they are in phase three. No, all I can do is teach you principles. When Kimberly Holmes, the CEO of our organization, and I write the book on limerence, which we've already started working on, we're going to try to make it clearer in the book. But even then, I will not give the ability to you to read the other person's mind. We can't tell you hard and fast these are the rules. If you've understood this and your spouse is in limerence, use this knowledge for you to grow. If you are the one who is in limerence, please don't think of me as being your enemy, although I think you might. Understand I've been exactly where you are. And what I've been sharing with you is not just my opinion. There's good, solid science behind that. And not only that, Hundreds of thousands of couples that we've worked through. And if you're thinking, yeah, but we're different. It won't apply to us. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. So have thousands of others until they found that as unique as we are, in this matter, we're all very much alike. And the end will come as I predicted. I'm sorry for that pain. We'll see you next week on this program. Thank you for listening.